Okay, let's start that again. Hi, Lucy, welcome. So Casey Stewart is our guest today and she is a PhD candidate emphasizing in art and visual culture education and teacher education. Over the past decade, she has taught visual art and art history to pre-K through 12 students in a variety of environments, ranging from homeschool co-ops to one of the nation's top charter schools. She completed her master's degree in art and visual culture education from the University of Arizona in 2013, focusing on the application of care theory in inclusive classrooms. Currently, she is researching pre-service art teachers' use of online resources and social media and curriculum development. Welcome, Casey. Thank you for being here. All right, everyone. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share my screen with you. Okay, so I just want to thank all of you for joining uh, this presentation today. What I'm going to be presenting on is in process data collection and kind of a little bit of a, a narrative retelling of how this research came about. And as of now, it's titled, I found it, I liked it, I taught it, exploring pre-service art teachers use and transformation of social media and curriculum development. When I submitted my proposal for emerging conversations, one of the themes that we could kind of grab onto was this idea of heirloom, of things that are passed down from generation to generation. And I started kind of conceptualizing curriculum itself as an heirloom. Teachers who are mentors have pre-service teachers, they kind of pass down their wisdom. And with that wisdom, they pass down binders full of lesson plans, they pass down teaching resources. And now in classrooms where I'm spending a lot of my time, instead of that binder full of lesson plans, the heirloom has transformed and been given life via online platforms. So now these curricular resources are being passed down through online resources, through different websites, through blogs, through veteran teachers that are trying to get their curriculum out there in new ways. These curricular heirlooms, so to speak, are very much beloved, especially when it comes from that mentor-mentee relationship. They are passed down, but are they re-examined? So how did this research start? In 2019, I was able to take uh, one of Dr. Wilson's special topics courses on uh, cultural studies. And cultural studies kind of had us put on a framework, a lens, through which we could kind of get to examine our own practice of consumption and reproduction, what we're consuming, what that says about us, how it's perpetuating the status quo, and really kind of tie those tenets of cultural studies to what we're doing in art education. At the time that I was in Dr. Will uh, Wilson's class, I was in my second semester of teaching ARE 493B, which is the capstone course for undergraduates who are in ABCE and want to be classroom teachers. So it's that semester where they are in their school placements with their mentor teachers. And then I kind of go in, observe them, and we have seminar meetings discussing what they're doing in the classroom. It kind of surprised me because, and it, it might've just been like a, a cutoff kind of difference. When I was entering classrooms, um, smart devices were like just kind of becoming a thing. And so all of my curriculum planning came from like, I mean, I was going to Bookman's on the weekends and trying to find different lesson planning resources, uh, contemporary art and art history books, kind of anything I could get my hands on to give me some ideas for what I should do in the classroom. But more and more, I saw that my student teachers were talking about going on Pinterest and who they were following. And did you see this influencer on Instagram who's also an art teacher and what they're doing? And so I started talking with them a little bit more on, wait, who are you looking at? Where are you getting your lesson plan ideas? And more and more, Pinterest was kind of the genesis of, their, uh, of what they were finding. And so I decided to take an examination of Pinterest and select a case, a case being kind of one of the top contributors. And what you uh, read on the left side of the screen were the um, qualifying factors that I took into account in order to select the case. So first, they must pin art lessons that were suitable for secondary levels. And that was just because the student teachers I was working with at the time were largely in junior high to high school age groups. So it was more relevant to the population that I was working with. 
The contributor must be a practicing art teacher. There are a lot of contributors to Pinterest that come from kind of bigger corporations. Um, think of like dickblick.com, things like that, and you can find resources. And so I was interested in the individual voice of a, of a teacher to get a scope of their teaching practice. Third, the contributor must have a high number of followers, so to show that they are relevant. And lastly, that they were active posting within the last couple of months, again, just to kind of narrow down the scope of who I was looking at, because there are a lot of contributors on that uh, site to make it as current and relevant as I could. Hmm. Oh, okay, we'll do it that way. Sorry, I couldn't figure out how to get to the next slide there. So the RD teacher rose to the top of all of those different uh, case selection criteria. She had at the time in 2019, just over 11,000 followers and about 800,000 monthly website views, which at the time was like, whoa, that's a lot of monthly website views for these art lessons. Anyways, her goal, stated goal on the about page of her website and her blog was to provide quality, inspiring and visually appealing art resources to art teacher around the globe at an affordable price that essentially helps make their lives easier. And this was something that I noticed of about the top five or six contributors that I found in their statement as to why are you putting these art lessons out into the ether for teachers, for homeschooling parents, for whoever may come across them. It was to make life easier, not necessarily to provide high quality art education, not to promote lessons that are in keeping with current practices in art education, but just to make life easy. And now as somebody who was in the classroom, I mean, it's very appealing to make life a little bit easier for sure, I get it. Um, but it was just very telling to me that the point and like the stated goal of these contributors was to provide a service as a, at a cost to make life a little easier, to have a visually enticing, aesthetically pleasing, pretty product. The RD teacher, along with the other contributors that I was looking at, really seemed to fall into what I kind of had remembered as one of my very early readings in art education and like my master's program, um, which was from Arthur Eflund in the 70s called School Art. And in his uh, article on school art, he was talking about how a lot of classroom practices were free of conceptual strain, meaning that the student, the work that they were making, the concept was not derived from their individual experience, from what they wanted to make, but rather it was a teacher saying, this is the type of art you're going to make. Second, the pieces are all unified under the same prompt. If any of you have ever kind of walked through an elementary school, you see like the beautiful, you know, nice uh, bulletin boards with the little crinkly edges on them and all of the very uh, similar, very neat looking, very organized uh, artistic products. Third, visually inviting. So again, they look kind of impressive. It looks like there's a very nice, tidy, neat, organized, product-centered art classroom happening. And then lastly, that there are no copies from direct artistic influences. And so what this chart is showing are these are the lessons that were on the RD teacher's website that I could access. And then I ran each one of them through uh, Eflin's characteristics of school art, just to kind of provide an example and an illustration of how aligned a lot of her uh, lesson plans were with this art style that was critiqued in the 70s, but is being perpetuated in nearly the 2020s. The uh, lessons that she had posted were almost completely compliant with those first three characteristics of Eflin's uh, school art style. The only area in which her lessons were not uh, great examples of school art was, is it, you know, not a copy of uh, an artist's resources or an artist's particular style. And as you can see in some of the titles, like the Cezanne unit, she would be showing a Cezanne piece and the students would be copying it directly. And so, again, not aligned with necessarily what was being identified in the 70s, but also not aligned with what current research and art education would say is what we should be encouraging our students to do. So at the time, I have the RD teacher here. That art teacher was another really popular contributor, and so was the Art of Education. This is just a snapshot of how many followers they had in 2019 and how many monthly website views each one of these contributors had. 
So how's it going? Same snapshot. I looked at these various sites just a couple nights ago. And as you can see, the followers have doubled as have the monthly website views, which is kind of staggering. And so it makes me pause and think, okay, so what are all the various pieces of the puzzle that are going on right now? First and foremost, we're coming out of a pandemic that completely changed and really necessitated change in a lot of teachers teaching practice because teachers who were classroom teachers for years and years and years were now in these online spaces and needing to provide different types of resources for their students in order to be able to work from home and learn from home. Now, Am I arguing that all of the uptick in monthly followers was just from art teachers who are now looking for resources? No, of course not. But I do think that there was probably a significant amount of us who are now spending more time on social media looking for these online resources. And whether they're art teachers, parents looking for uh, activities for their students to do, homeschooling parents, kind of various users are going to be looking at these sites. The other kind of segue that I now wish to make is not only talking about what do practicing teachers, where do they go, where are they looking for their curricular inspiration, but also having a recognition of Gen Z. They are today's pre-service teachers and tomorrow's art teachers. As I noted just in my, my own experience in 2019 of the difference in how I entered the classroom looking for curricular resources and how my student teachers were entering and looking for curricular resources. Undeniably, there, there was a generational difference just in our habits, our, our habits with using online resources and social media. Gen Z has a relationship to technology and to smart devices that is entirely different to any generation that has come before them. On average, members of Gen Z had their first cell phone at just 10 years old. Also, on average, Gen Zers use social media and online resources for an hour, or excuse me, an average of three hours every single day. So with that realization, I'm trying to kind of recognize what tools are in the toolbox for art educators right now. And it is not my position nor my desire to say that these online resources that we see, things like Pinterest, Instagram influencers, these are not tools in the toolkit that need to be rejected. They're just tools in the toolkit that I think we as university educators, as those who are responsible for working with and collaborating with pre-service art teachers and making sure that they are prepared for their own classroom spaces. I just believe that it's a tool in a toolkit that we should recognize and then perhaps develop some critical tools and critical frameworks from which to assess these tools so that if they are going to be used, there's a baseline sense of knowledge of what to look out for, what to look for, and maybe what to transform, what to change in order to strengthen a particular lesson plan that is found online or where the idea kind of comes from before it is brought into our classroom spaces. So that there's a heightened level of awareness of, of really the responsibility of what we are consuming from online spaces and then reproducing for our K-12 students and really trying to think through that process so that high quality art lesson plans are what are, is being perpetuated. All right. So the gap in significance from this research um, really came not only from personal experiences, but also in researching the literature that does come from our field. Uh, I was able to find that in 2017, NAEA commissioned a survey, and the survey was meant to gauge the use of traditional print resources for art educators versus online resources um, in teacher educational practice. And that spanned from pre-K teachers all the way up to university educators, and really just asking teachers, hey, what is it that you're using and why are you using it and why are you going to those sources? So Buffington and Sutter's found kind of unsurprisingly that there was a vast predominance of teachers using online resources, using blogs, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest for their lesson planning ideas over using any traditional print resources like NAEA magazine, studies in art education, all the journals that I think a lot of us have kind of come to love and uh, really get excited when they you know, come in the mail or whatever over the past few years. Um, and so the researchers in their closing statements to the survey data were saying that these widely available resources 
might contribute to part practitioner knowledge. And that's great that these resources are available in such a, you know, it's at your fingertips kind of a way. But there was also a warning that these types of resources could also cause unexamined or ineffective approaches to art education to circulate very widely and to disseminate that information incredibly quickly. And just kind of as an aside, one thing that I found kind of amazing as I was looking through just the staggering number of followers and of monthly website views, I was trying to, in my mind, to really contrast millions of monthly website views to, you know, us, all of us who are in academia right now, we think of a journal's impact factor. What is that score? How impactful is this journal? And then if we are to be published in one of these journals, which is a huge accomplishment for somebody in academia, but what is the citation rate of a particular article? And an article that has, you know, 150 citations linked to it is like, whoa, that's an incredibly impactful article. But that's 150 citations versus 3.3 million monthly website views. And so when we're talking about what is impacting curricular practice, the survey da data is showing us that those more accessible online resources are incredibly powerful. And so what are they saying and how can we kind of get in there a little bit and maybe start to shift what is even available in these online resources? So the purpose of my study that I have uh, started this semester and that I will be continuing on for the next couple months is to contribute understandings from the perspective of pre-service art teachers enrolled in their semester of student teaching as to why they are using social media as a curricular resource and if and how these teachers can critically analyze and transform their approach to using these sources. Uh, I wanted to go ahead and include my research questions as well to just kind of position uh, everything that I'm talking about. So first, how do pre-service art teachers employ social media as a resource during their student teaching? After engaging with an intervention on assessing lesson plans critically, how do pre-service art teachers reflect upon and or transform their lesson plans? In this process, how do they transform the original intervention? And I'll be getting into what I mean by intervention pretty soon here. And then lastly, how does the process of finding, analyzing, and redesigning lesson plans found via social media transform their approach to designing curriculum for themselves? All right, so a quick overview of the study. Right now, I'm teaching uh, for, uh, this is my second year of teaching ARE 493B. Currently, there are four students who are enrolled. Um, however, for ethical reasons, right now, I actually don't know how many of them are participating. And so for that reason, while I'm sharing some of the uh, kind of the general things that have been going on during data collection with you all today, I won't be showing specific works from participants um, because I won't know who is participating until after I've submitted grades at the end of the semester. All right. so. Undergirding everything that I'm doing in this research is transformative learning theory. And it's a learning theory that's concerned with the process of critically examining habitual experiences, which a lot of my research is also showing just the habit forming power of using social media. Um, so examining that habitual experience, revising it, and acting on the revised point of view, which leads hopefully in an ideal transformative learning theory world, would lead learners toward a frame of reference that is more inclusive, more discriminating, self-reflective, and that integrates the process of that transformation into their current practice. Transformative learning theory uh, originally was cited as, uh, as a, an event that can occur as a result of two things. The first being engaging in critical education and dialogue so that learners can become aware and critical of their own assumptions, their own actions, their own habitual practices. And then second, facilitated activities or interventions that give learners practice in recognizing their own frame of reference and then practice in imagining a different way to define what it is that they are doing. There's a whole body of research. It's actually a, like a journal on transformative learning theory that has arisen since the inception of this theory uh, in the 90s. 
And one of the more uh, current voices in transformative learning theory is that of Patricia Cranton. And I particularly like her approach to transformative learning theory because she recognizes power relationships and power relationship differences, particularly between teacher and student or researcher and participant, and how to flatten those, how to really kind of raise up and strategies to raise up the voice of the participant so that the process of transformation is really being driven by the student or by the participant and not by the researcher. Because if I'm the only one who's driving this, this change in behavior, then it is not going to be lasting and it is not gonna be nearly as meaningful. So that arrival at a new way of thinking really needs to be self-derived if it is to have any sort of lasting impact. In terms of methodology, uh, the study is based on two different methods and they're not evenly split. I'd say it's probably about an 80-20 split. The 80 being uh, design-based research. And that's a methodology that uh, comes out of educational research, and it's very, very practice-based and practice-oriented. It's when somebody within a learning environment recognizes something that needs to be investigated further or sees a particular problem within an educational space and then designs an intervention. And an intervention can be anything in terms of like a uh, it can be a packet of worksheets, it can be a particular activity that is done in a classroom setting. And then in the, the tradition of design-based research is all about taking whatever that activity or that, that special designed curricular practice is, and then testing it and amending it over an iterative cycle of development so that as it changes, you can track its development. Now that's obviously very researcher driven. I also want to include the critical piece that is cooperative inquiry, um, because in that tradition, the kind of the, the, the quote that I pulled out from cooperative inquiry that truly I love the most is by Heron and Reason. And they mentioned that good research is done with people, not on people. And so although as the researcher, I'm the one who's kind of made this initial curricular inter intervention, I'm not the one who's redesigning it. It was really important to me that as the uh, intervention went through the process of research, that it was really the participants, the co-inquirers that were the ones who ended up changing it to fit their needs, to fit their vision of what art education should be. So what is the intervention? So the intervention is something that I'm just calling the lesson planning activity. In its very initial stages of development, it was the first iteration again was designed by me. In the next uh, coming slides, I'm gonna show you how it's transformed. And those other versions of the lesson planning activity were designed by the student teachers in 493B. So the intervention is a guided note-taking uh, packet of worksheets on how lesson plans are found online. And I know, it may, I don't know, even when I talk about it, when I say the intervention, it sounds very like, what is this research thing? It's a packet of, of worksheets. And it's meant to just try to under, better understand what the thought process is of student teachers as they use social media. And so in this packet of worksheets, it's, you know, what site are you going to? Why are you going to that site? How often do you go there? When you go, let's say to Pinterest, what are you typing in the search bar? Is it lessons for high schoolers? Is it more specific than that? Are you looking for you know, clay projects, for drawing projects? Are you searching for artists? So whatever that thought process is that gets them from taking out their phone to selecting a lesson that they think to themselves, oh, I wanna use that. So every little step that has to happen between picking up the phone and then saying, yes, this is something that I'm gonna bring into my classroom of documenting what that practice is like. Also in the first iteration of the lesson planning activity, um, there is a, a self-assessment that's based on the characteristics of school art that I talked about earlier. Um, and then there was also another article that came out in 2013 by Olivia Good that talked about practices of the new school art. And in the new school art, she was advocating that a lot of the product-centered critique that Eflin Rose and 
the 1970s was still very much alive and kicking in the 2010s. And so how do we kind of get to a better place of more authentic art educational practice of including art historical and contemporary artists, of in infusing our lessons with more uh, contemporary topics such as multicultural art education, social justice art education, and how to weave those into our practice. And so in this first lesson planning activity, student teachers, once they found a lesson plan uh, from so a social media or online resource based site, they had to kind of identify, okay, does this fall into the school art characteristics? Or does this fall under new school art characteristics? Is it embracing some of the topics that I've learned about in my you know, ABCE preparation to get to this point? Or is it largely just another kind of unified product, aesthetically pleasing product-centered lesson? 75% of the lessons that they found were aligned again with the school art style. So really needing a lot of revision in order to get to um, to really embody more of what we're trying to bring into our classrooms uh, within our field. The last portion of the lesson planning activity was for them to then rewrite the lesson and create an example artwork that was based on all the changes that they felt needed to take place. Then they brought all of that back to class. We have five meetings over the course of the semester. And so really in each of those uh, meetings, we're talking about what they did for the lesson planning activity and then we're brainstorming ways to change it. So the second version of the lesson planning activity, we kept the worksheet format. Um, they said that they all really liked the worksheet format. I think maybe because they are still very much in the thick of being in school. And so that guided practice was particularly helpful. But they said that having full reign over any topic that they wanted to choose was almost too much freedom. And they also said that a lot of the topics that they felt were important to bring into art classrooms, they couldn't really find on Pinterest, on social media. So topics like social justice, like diversity and inclusivity, like multicultural art education, business aspects of art and art criticism and critique, they had a difficult time these were topics that they really felt passionately about bringing into the classroom, but that they didn't really see on social media. So we amassed this list and that was just based on group discussion, a little bit of debate. They went back and forth in order to derive a list of topics that are important to bring into the art classroom. From here, they were to choose one of these topics. Again, try to find a lesson plan. And then they assessed that lesson plan that they found based on the traits of effective lessons. And that's what you see on the screen right now. The traits of effective lessons, um, this was also derived from the participants, from these students in 493B. These are a list of the kind of initial characteristics that they felt very strongly should be in every lesson that is brought into their classrooms. And so after they chose their topic, that they felt very passionately about bringing into the art classroom, finding a lesson from social media that fit that topic. Then they assessed the lesson based on these effective traits and said, okay, does this lesson include these traits or does it not include these traits? And if it does not include them, again, how do I redesign it to make sure that all of these kind of boxes are checked off and again, these uh, traits of effective lessons were coming from the readings that they did in class, were coming from their own classroom practice, and we were discussing them and they were self-generating this list. There might be more traits of effective lessons that I personally would add in or would take out, um, but truly I want it to be based on the voices of the pre-service teachers because uh, it's a reflection of the culmination of their education in our program so far, and of, of what they're doing and how they're looking at these particular sources. All right. So that brings us to lesson planning activity round three. So actually this just happened last week. And so when they came to class, they came prepared with all of their responses, their revised lessons to the second lesson planning activity. We discussed what they created and two of the potential participants, so two of the student teachers, had tried to create lessons that dealt with multicultural 
art education themes and social justice art education themes. In that discussion, as a group, they decided that we need to have traits for effective lesson plans that are particularly tied to those subjects and how those types of lessons should be brought into our classroom. So for example, um, they felt that this was particularly relevant and needed. Um, the student who wanted to focus on multicultural art education could not find a lesson plan on social media that was not in some way indicative of cultural stereotyping or cultural appropriation. She could not find one. And so there was a lot of revising that had to happen in order to create a lesson plan that was suitable for K to 12 learners. As we were talking about uh, what these students were finding, we also started talking about potentially the need to kind of transform and to change our whole concept of the lesson planning activity. We're talking about social media here. We're talking about online resources. And our plan to kind of combat and to critically examine these is a packet of worksheets. That didn't make any sense. And so as a group, we decided that we needed to shift into an online or into a digital space with a tool to help critically assess these lessons. And so the image that you see on the side of the screen is just a screenshot of an Adobe XD document where I'm now uh, creating a prototype for an app. And as a group, we decided to call it the art of lesson planning. And the app will essentially do three different things. It will explain where, kind of give different resources and explain where our ideas for the traits of effective lesson plans comes from. It will give educators a kind of uh, a quiz that they can run their own lesson plan through to see if it is aligned with these traits of effective lesson plans. And so there'll be a quiz, if you have a lesson plan, maybe that you found online that you're thinking about bringing into your classroom, you can run it through this really quick self-assessment tool. And if, um, depending on the user's answers, the app will generate suggestions of, you know, of how to strengthen that particular lesson plan. And then lastly, the app will have um, a page that's dedicated to lesson plans that are fitting in with all of these ideas for what topics should be brought into our classrooms and what traits of effective lesson plans uh, that we have generated. So they kind of tick off all of those boxes. So that way, um, these lessons can be posted on my student teachers Instagram pages with a link to this particular uh, app. We can have um, these lesson plans also linked on social media on Pinterest so that they can be clicked taken to a page like this or taken so that they can open up an app like this. This is kind of hypothetical right now. Um, but so that this type of resource can also enter and maybe disrupt a little bit those digital spaces and at least offer a different type of art lesson plan that is not school art based, that is not product centered, that is very much conscious of the potential pitfalls of calling something multicultural art education when it is not, of calling something social justice art education if it is not, and kind of how to conceptualize those topics and to bring those topics into art classrooms should teachers choose to do so. So as of right now, that's kind of where research is. We've transformed from this idea of making worksheets as a critical self-reflective tool to designing a prototype app that would be used for critical self-reflection and also as a resource um, for effective lesson plans that can be brought into K-12 spaces. Uh, of course, the app would require, um, unfortunately, I found out yesterday about $10,000 in order to uh, be made, but funding is out there. So I think that's something that I'll be looking to, uh, to potentially do in the future to, again, just kind of provide some sort of different uh, discussion point in these, in these online spaces. Thank you. Are there any questions? Are you comparing? Um, thank you. That was wonderful, Casey. Thanks. Um, do I, I'm I guess I'm old school, and I'm used to having a curriculum guide. Is that no longer a thing? I, mean, I know that it, the younger generation you're saying is like 
I've gone online and found if I have a lesson plan in mind that I want to have the things that I want to, I will go and try to get some different altering ideas and opinions about it. So what, what's the standard these days in terms of curriculum? For the most part, what I'm seeing with the, because again, when I started at like the charter school that I was at, there was a curriculum guide just in terms of generally what needed to be addressed in the, in the mm-hmm. classroom for that particular year. Most of the mentor teachers that I've been interacting with over the past couple of years, it is very, very open-ended and they are the ones who are dictating what they want to bring into the classroom. Of course, it's standards aligned. Um, however, there isn't necessarily a like an overarching theme for each grade level for the content that needs to be covered. So it is largely self-generated. And for the most part too, our student teachers are being asked to create lesson plans. And that's something that actually personally, I had a little bit of an an issue with because when I was planning out art curriculum, I didn't think in terms of plan, 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 like little lesson plan. It was large units, Mm -hmm. full year long scope of curriculum. Yeah. But starting in that way with them in the semester was completely overwhelming to them. And so another thing that we kind of have been doing with the lesson planning activity is making sure that whatever lesson you chose for the first lesson planning activity is built upon in the second and built upon in the third to try to give them some practical application of how to create a unit, how to create a plan and how to scaffold the various techniques and concepts that you're teaching to your students. And I think I'd see that's the biggest problem that I would have with online resources that you don't have that scaffolding. Right. No, absolutely. And I think, um, I mean, our, our very early discussions that I had recorded with uh, the student teachers, it was largely, it, it kind of surprised me, but it was, well, why do you use this particular influencer? Like somebody, I don't know if those of you who are listening have ever heard of Cassie Stevens, all of them brought up Cassie Stevens and she's incredibly popular on Instagram, TikTok and Pinterest. She's an elementary art teacher who like dresses up like different artists who um, posts everything that she does in the classroom. And it is, I mean, it is like a visual feast but it's very tightly controlled by the teacher. Mm. There is very little opportunity for individual student voice. Um, and the most popular word that was used even just by my student teachers and why they, they like her and they like using her is because it's cute. Mm. And so getting past that, like, yeah, I know it looks Instagram, yeah. but like, what do you right. actually want to do actually was like a pretty big hurdle to get over. Yeah. No, there was actually one student teacher who said that she came into the ABCE program because of Cassie Stevens. Oh, wow. She said that if, my, if my life could look as like colorful and happy as hers does, then that was definitely a job that I wanted to do, which oh, wow. I was danger I was to hear that. Yeah, danger, some major danger. Yeah. <laughs> Red flag. <laughs> yeah. So, but it's definitely difficult to kind of like to take yeah. in and to not to not be overly, for me at least too, to not be overly judgmental about, because yeah, about, yeah. you know, that, that inspired her to get into the field. Yeah, so it's yeah. like, okay, but what else can we do with that? And how right. can we make sure? Because I mean, there are also, just so you all know, one of the mentor teachers purchases uh, lessons from Deep Space Sparkle, which is again, along the same kind of lines. Um, and so, I mean, that's what my student teacher was learning, like use mm-hmm. these resources, purchase this curriculum, put it in the classroom. And I would say that so far she's, that particular student teacher has had the biggest transformation because she kind of had this aha moment where it was like, oh, whoa, this is really stereotypical. Like mm-hmm. I was, you know, teaching very racially essentializing themes but it had come from Deep Space Sparkle and her mentor was, you know, telling her to use it. And so it becomes, I think, a little confusing to not just say like, this is an established art teacher. She's great. I have a nice relationship with her. I should use it. I have a question. Um, hi. hi, first of all, Casey, I'm, I'm, I know we've never met in person, but I've heard a lot about Um, your work and this particular project um, through um, doing other engagements with um, (laughs) Pinterest and being frustrated with it. Um, So it's really great to to hear more about how you got to this process. Um, You had mentioned um, the pre-service teacher who couldn't find lesson plans that didn't 
perpetuate stereotypes or appropriate. Um, and I'm wondering, do you think that th this is um, a result of kind of superficial content on Pinterest or has this been an inadequacy in art education in general, like looking back through print resources as well? It's definitely from the the review of literature that I'm also amassing right now, it has been a problem for, for a while, both in print resources and then it can, I think just kind of perpetuating the same problems on uh, Pinterest and other online resources. I think a major problem is that these resources are being labeled as multicultural art education. And so it's almost like, it's almost as though we know this is almost a buzzword for our field, like we're supposed to do multicultural art education practices and to bring those in. And so as long as we label the thing that we're doing as that, then we're kind of being compliant in that and we're, we're bringing multiculturalism into our classroom without taking a much deeper dive. The, the student who eventually came to the point of saying, I can't find anything, she actually like two lesson planning activities ago chose one of those lessons saying like, yeah, I'm going to bring multiculturalism into my classroom and this is how I'm doing it. But it was through our class discussions where she actually literally had like the like deer in headlights moment of, oh my gosh, what I'm doing is really wrong. But it wasn't that initial, that initial realization wasn't there. And part of what I was doing in the class was giving them reading. So there, there's an article that was uh, written just a few years ago on particularly on Pinterest and issues with multicultural art education and how the resources that are available are skimming the surface and they're perpetuating stereotypes. Um, and so I gave her that, that reading. And so it wasn't necessarily me saying like, hey, you're doing this wrong. It was just check out this research and tell me what you think. And that helped to trigger that, that aha moment. Um, I also I have another question, um, unless someone else. Um, I I also wonder because you talked about like um, you know things look really good on Pinterest and that is a really big appeal, and so I'm also wondering if that is being transferred um, to the students. Like when you talked about the deep space sparkle, it was a little triggering for me because. Um, I used to work for an organization who they wanted to shift to that. And that was kind of my breaking point where I said, I, I'm not going to do that. I don't believe that that is what I like, what, what I believe art education could be. Right. Um, and in part, because it was asking students to create um, projects that all followed um, these certain steps. So they would all look good. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm so I'm wondering if, that is something that you are looking at or that your students are um, thinking critically about of like, what are the outcomes of these particular um, lesson plans for the student's sense of um, accomplishment and aesthetics? That's something that last week when we had our discussion, we're gonna have another meeting coming up was a real point of contention because a lot of, even right now, even realizing some of the problems that they've encountered with these online-based lesson plans, they still are worried to incorporate lessons that are not about an aesthetically pleasing product because they've learned from their mentor teachers that having that project that looks like the teachers is what builds student confidence. That's what they're being told. And so we're tr I'm trying to have conversations with them of, well, what else builds student confidence and how else can we do that without the only metric of confidence building being you can copy somebody else's work or you can make it look like the teachers. And so we've started having more conversations too about artistic behaviors about, okay, so when you are in your own home studio making art, what does your artistic practice look like? Does it look like what you're actually doing in the classroom or is it entirely different? And why is it entirely different? What builds up your confidence as an artist? Is it time to be able to experiment with materials? It is, is it, you know, kind of playful mark making? What, what is it that gets you as an artist to a place of developing confidence? And how can we mirror that with our students? But right now there's still, I would say very much a wall in terms of, and even if they'll they'll talk about different ways to build up a student at the end of the day like when I part of my 
research is not what I'm observing in their classrooms. That's separate. Data collection is only happening in our class meetings. But you know, we have these conversations and it seems like these, these realizations are made. But then as soon as I go into their classrooms, it's still the, you know, step by step, I do, you do. This is going to be the the end product. So I don't know if tackling that is possible within like a the framework that I have while also looking at these other things. But I think there's a lot more that is needed in terms of understanding what that is and breaking down that barrier of we need to have the pretty product. Because it's kind of it's debilitating for students. For sure. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks. I'm going to stop sharing the screen just because I can see that there might have been a couple. OK, so I just want to make sure in the comment section there wasn't any uh, questions. Yeah, maybe I could just um, uh, say something. I really like what you're doing, Casey. Uh, mine is just a comment. Uh, you talked about how inaccessible art research is uh, because uh, very few teachers will access like uh, uh, journals from um, art education. And uh, the issue here is about making our work pretty, as you said, because mm -hmm. the teachers want to use something that is pretty. So probably maybe as... Um, researchers and art educators, we might uh, think of um, writing um, journals or, or articles that are, are pretty or give information that is pretty so that it's accessible to, to, to all, especially to the teachers. Mm -hmm. Just a comment. No, I agree with that, Lucy. Thank you. And I mean, also potentially, you know, having graphics designed for you know various topics that come because a, a lot of especially in the NAEA magazine and journal they're very accessible very readable and there's a lot of content for for classroom teachers but it's almost like there just needs to be more of an effort to post you know images that then link to those articles on Pinterest, on Instagram, on these different spaces, then of course there might be the issue of, you know, can we make certain resources open source so that you don't have to continue paying for membership in order to access them? Because sometimes the membership to NAEA is a lot more expensive than the membership to these other um, teacher resources and teacher sites. Um, so that becomes, it's the paywalls that become an issue in terms of accessing information. And so what's, what's free or what's cheaper is what they're looking at more. Well, I think if there's no other questions, I think our time is up. Anybody have any? Concluding thoughts. Thank you all for attending today. If there's any other questions that you can think of, feel free. I included my email address, uh, undoubtedly, in, in one of the email chains for our department. My email's in there, so feel free to reach out. Um, I'm in the process of data collection and will be writing. So truly, any of your thoughts or questions are so appreciated because it can, you know, get me thinking in a way that maybe I'm not right now, and that should that I should be and should be including in my writing. Thanks everybody. Thank you so much, Casey. We'll end our meeting. Thank you so much. <laughs>